you said you experienced depression, some form of depression or depression, depressive feelings and sadness in prison. What, what were the thoughts that were coming up? What? So <laughs> this is a, a question that I might ask too in this situation. Everything depends on what Andrew Tate, if he were to talk with me or someone like him, what they wanted from me. Mm -hmm. You know, you might wonder, well, why would someone like Andrew Tate even come to therapy? Well, I'll tell you from memory and also just from research, that people who present like Andrew Tate, they're, they might come across like they have everything figured out and they might consciously believe that they have everything figured out, but the underlying traumas and their defenses and the way they treat other people result often in them having a very hard time getting their needs met, specifically their needs met regarding dependency, interdependency, mutual dependency and love and attachment and neediness. They deny their neediness very firmly and are very upset if you even imply that they have needs around this, that they, that they have normal human emotions and attachment needs. And so they will go their whole life without getting those needs met and they will become um, symptomatic in some way. Okay, this video is Dr. Kirkonda talking about Andrew Tate going to therapy part two. This is on the YouTube channel called Cobra Conquer. Let's watch and see. Cobra Conquer. See, even the names they pick is so interesting for branding, like Hustle University, Hustlers University. Like everything is very specifically chosen to convey and signal a specific thing. What happens? Which is going to allow me to be a fierce competitor in all realms of human endeavor. Mm -hmm. Has, have there been some of your beliefs or convictions that have been challenged oh, through sure. the experiences that you've had, particularly in the last, well, recently? Well, people challenge me often. And what a lot of people don't understand is that yeah, so David Sutcliffe was asking, I believe, what he was asking was, have any of your beliefs that you had prior to all the things that have happened to you lately, have, has reality challenged those such that you've changed your beliefs or have you challenged your own beliefs at all? That's what David is asking, I think. That's a, you know, kind of a, a good question to ask given where Andrew Tate was, was headed. And then Andrew Tate in, answers it in the way that he did, which is, well, yeah, people are trying to challenge my my beliefs, and this is how that they're all wrong. Isn't that interesting that David asked a question about just Andrew Tate? Mm. <laughs> like, forget everyone else. Just think about yourself. When have you, and maybe David will follow it up with that, but has there been a time when you changed your belief based on what was happening to you? And That's why I say most people are twos. And most people, though they can be independent within the bubbles, absolutely view their reality against other people's reality and bubble. So Andrew Tate even, who claims to be an independent thinker and claims to be uh, anti-woke and claims to think for himself and cla claims to know that there's a matrix, even Andrew Tate, when asked about himself, references other people. And I think that is something that I pay attention to when I'm asking someone about themselves. Are you making it about other people? When I ask you about yourself, like, what do you like? What do you want to do with your life? And you answer, well, my family expects this of me. Oh, well, I'm a Muslim. I have to do this. Oh, I'm a Catholic. I have to do this. Oh, I'm gay. I have to do this. You're not actually having a relationship with your consciousness or you are, but it's not a full relationship. And so what I want to encourage you to do, if you want to, no pressure, is have a more full, well-rounded relationship with your consciousness and ask yourself, what do you want to do as a consciousness, not as like a gender or a race or anything? What do you want to do? But when your whole brand, your whole shtick, whether it's true or not, Andrew Tate, is about being a man and being an alpha and being a provider and being everything to other people and not even in a selfless way, in a very ego-driven way, he'll claim it's out of sacrifice for others, but that's obviously not true, right? He has no humility within him. There's absolutely no humility here. So it's like, okay, what is this really about? And I think people really do struggle knowing themselves because everyone else, well, there's more people and they're much louder, you know, which is why I ask you to meditate and ask yourself, what would I do if it was just me? If it was just me, what would I do? Not if no one ever existed, not if you never loved anyone, but if it was just up to you, what would you want to do in a real way, like in a real, real way? You know, not in a fantasy way of I'm tired, I just want to sit on my butt, not do anything for three weeks. That's not real. That's temporary. What would you want to do with your life? Not, oh, I want a Bugatti, I want to race it down uh, the one, you know, in California. No, not like that. 
I mean, what do you want to do with your existence, your your short time on earth with your existing? What do you want to do with this one little moment of life that you have or that you're aware of? You know, it's a very hard question to answer because everyone always gives a temporary answer. I want to eat a lot of food. I want to hang out. I want to play video games. I want to have lots of sex. Like, that's not what I'm asking. <laughs> that's so superficial. I'm asking, what do you want to do with your limited time on earth? With your, with your very limited time on earth. And that's kind of like the paradox where people will say, you know, can God make a rock so big that he, that he can't even pick it up? Yeah. Either answer says that God is not omnipotent, right? And when you ask someone, and I, I have no idea what Andrew Tate's real personality is, but his public- Wait, do you guys know that? That, that uh, thought experiment is like, can a God create a rock that he can't even pick up? You know, it's a very good like, ooh, like mental puzzle you have to figure out because either way, God isn't omnipotent. Like he said, it's like saying God can neither outsmart himself nor present a problem he cannot solve. It's like very interesting. Persona is the one. It's pretty consistent. And, I'll, you know, what it, his public persona is such that if you ask him that question, have you ever had a belief that you found to be wrong and you changed it, right. then that's in a similar vein, not exactly the same as that God right. with the rock thing. Because if he, you know, on one hand, it's like, well, yeah, I, I have full control over myself, so I'm going to change my beliefs. You know, I'm, I'm that strong. But on the other side, at some point, he had to have been wrong. So there's no way out of that question. There's no answer to that question that will have his public persona upheld in which he's perfect <laughs> and he's never been wrong. So he, at the very least, uh, you know, po possibly subconsciously, but maybe consciously just interprets the question in this different way of like, well, yeah, people, you know, and also for people with this public persona, or I, I just say with this presentation, either publicly or privately, they are very outwardly focused. They're very, very focused on how other people see them. It's, it's really an obsession because they're in this constant state of trying to prove themselves because of what they went through when they were growing up. I will never adopt the thinking of somebody who is sad and I will never adopt the thinking of somebody who is less competitive than I am or less successful than I am. If someone comes along and goes, Andrew, you are wrong. The way you see the world is wrong, but they are suffering from an affliction. Mm -hmm. Why would I adopt a single one? And it's also possible, it, it, again, it's hard for me not to see this through my therapist lens. If I asked that question to an individual who was presenting this way, and they answered this way, I would wonder if they're actually saying something to me, which often will be the case. Clients like this, especially if they're volunteering for therapy, they don't want to get into a fight with me. That's not what they came to therapy for. So when they have what they perceive to be an attack, and people like this can absolutely perceive it as an attack, that question that David asked, which is, you know, did you ever have a belief that you had to change? I think a lot of people see that as an attack because they see it as like even even when people ask me that question, they're usually trying to get something out of me. So to be fair, unless the question is asked with very good faith and intent, I think it is also a got you question because they're trying to like prove a point, which is why I say like accountability is also knowing you were wrong, but in a way that transforms you. So knowing you are wrong in a way that doesn't transform you, transforms, does, doesn't transform you, means that you don't actually believe it's wrong in a way that's necessary. So sometimes people will want me to give people gold stars for changing, but you didn't change. You just like burnt, like you blew your house. Like, okay, you didn't change. You destroyed everything around you and said, look, I changed. It's like, no, that's not what transformation is. That's just destroying everything around you and being like different I'm different now I'm like you're not different you just that's not what it changes like to me a transformation is actually recognizing that you were wrong and you were wrong and it hurt you right so you're being self-aware and you're taking accountability but you're not being punished because you took accountability often people want to punish you for being wrong and I think those people are just as bad as the people that don't know that they need to transform. And I don't mean like in a moralizing way, I just mean in general. So if you ask someone like, have you ever been wrong? And you are trying to catch them, you're, you are just, just useless. Okay. 
And then if you're somebody who's already defensive and you're like, I've never changed. Oh yeah, I've changed my ideas, but you haven't actually transformed. Then you're, you're also like kind of useless because again, that's not what we're talking about, but that's why you also need a person who's having a real conversation with you to sort of ask you that question so you can actually talk about it. Because I know in the ways that I've been wrong and transformed, I love having those conversations with people. But to have that conversation, you have to have a real nuanced and understanding of it. No punishing people for changing. No holding them accountable and saying, aha, ha, see you were wrong. Because that's not what holding people accountable is. Again, I'm very much like if you've transformed, like I don't care what you did yesterday. Let's move forward, right? We watched the Twin Flames documentary and one of the people in the VC asked a really great question about whether or not the people who recruited people into the cult should be held accountable. And I said they already held themselves accountable. They already felt awful about it. They already mourned. They already apologized. They sought to make um, sort of amends by doing the documentary. So I society doesn't need to hold them accountable because that's useless. They held themselves accountable. I, I'm good. Like move forward, right? But for some people, I think people who are very ill-intentioned, people who are very cruel, would say, oh, these people need to be held accountable. They need to go to prison. There needs to be a fine. And I'm like, okay, relax, you crazy person. Just move forward, okay? They already know what they did was wrong. They transformed. They feel awful about it. And they're not going to do it again. Move forward. But people are so sadistic. They're so cruel that they really don't realize, like, you're torturing people by needing them to be held, um, by needing them to be punished. You know, don't punish people. But also don't give people gold stars before they've really transformed. No gold stars for the basics. Okay? Like you don't get a gold star for just pretending to change. And you certainly don't get a gold star for destroying everything around you. You don't get a gold star for throwing the baby out with the bathwater. You don't get a gold star for like doing the basics. Oh, oh my gosh. Like he stopped stealing from old ladies. Gold star. No. That's the basics. Oh, he stopped graping women. Okay, no. No gold star. Oh, he stopped serial cheating on his spouses. Okay, no gold star. Okay, that's what you were supposed to be doing. Cool, congratulations. But also, just stopping the habit isn't transforming. So no gold fucking star, you fucking bum. Okay, until you transform, I'm not gonna fucking give you a high five. And even after you transform, you should know that you don't need that high five because you should have done it in the fucking first place. Needing the high five after you transform tells me you haven't transformed. What do you need a high five for? You should know that the transformation was necessary. And you should have, you know what I'm saying? People want so many pats on the back for not being the worst person on the planet. It's like, sir, ma'am, no, no gold stars. Okay. Sneeko doesn't get a gold star if he like starts to treat women like people. Like no gold star. That was the basics. Okay. But transformation will lead him hopefully in the next 10 years or so into a place where he knows what he did was wrong and he can explain why and he can help people who might be stuck in the same place coming from a very authentic place. And he is going to have so much humility maybe one day if he takes the tools that he won't need a high five or a gold star because he'll know it was never about that in the first place. It was always just about transformation. It can be very threatening because they kind of know what that's implying and they also suspect that it's a question that reveals a bigger idea in the therapist's mind that is skepticism of the client's presentation and way of thinking. And so it's very threatening to them. And so some of them will respond in the way that Andrew Tate did by saying, well, yeah, people are always trying to tell me that I'm wrong. But what the client is really saying is, you're telling me that I'm wrong, mm. which isn't what David was saying. <laughs> but because of the traumas and the schemas and the lens, and the reactivity, that's how it's felt. And then the client will triangulate, talk about outside people, but they're really talking to the therapist. IO of what they say. So it, it's kind of funny when I talk about depression, the number of people who defend depression. Mm -hmm. Depression's ruined my life, it's super real, and I lost my wife, and my life is over, and I wanna kill myself, it's real. I'm like, surely you should like my, my worldview. If depression's so terrible and it's destroyed your entire existence, right. you should be listening. <laughs> I'm sure this is a straw man that he is constructing, the way he mockingly role plays people that are saying that depression is real. And then his response is just, just so, uh, well, 
it's deplorable to well it's cartoonish it's silly it's like cartoonish what it sounds like is someone reached out to him and said well i'm really depressed and your notion that somehow that you can just overcome depression by sheer willpower is not working for me or is hurting my feelings because it basically you're saying I'm weak or something. And so they're tr seemingly trying to convince Andrew to, no, no, depression is real. Believe me, I've been through some really bad experiences and now I have a hard. The reason they associate willpower with transformation is because they don't know the difference between the two words. You don't, you can't willpower yourself through depression. You transform, you transform yourself and willpower is the cope you use to get out of bed even though you're depressed but it is going to build up and you will have to like burn out because of it so willpower is the tool to get yourself out of bed and transformation is the actual tool the fundamental tool you use to have a different relationship with your depression or eradicate it from your life so it is true right that you can willpower your way out of bed and into work but willpower is like, again, taking from your bank account of spoons, energy, and you're working off negatives, right? So the concern is that willpower, every time you use it, it's building up a, a payment that you're going to have to pay, which usually comes in the form of burnout. So of course you can willpower your way out of bed, but you need to transform yourself as a consciousness to have a different relationship with depression. Our time getting up in the morning and I feel no motivation. And I don't take like I'm not sure that Andrew Tate isn't just coping like Sneeko said with his conversation with Dr. K, how he pushes down all his feelings and doesn't face them. Because if Andrew Tate is doing that, then Andrew Tate isn't actually having a transformation. He's coping so hard that eventually it might catch up to him or it might not. But it also is going to keep him from being more introspective. If you're holding all the burden of your cope then you're not allowing yourself an opportunity for introspection. The more introspection, the less cope. And it's not that cope needs to be eradicated. We all need to cope sometimes. But if you're coping all the time, like I don't have feelings or I push my feelings down or I don't have depression, maybe you don't have depression. But that doesn't mean somebody else doesn't have depression. Pleasure in anything anymore. And I need medication that kind of helps sometimes. And I go to therapy and it kind of helps sometimes. And But then another bad thing will happen to me. And and I, you know, I can't sleep at night or I sleep too much or I, I'm gaining weight or I can't eat or, you know, it, it's a, it's a real thing. <laughs> Obviously, I don't have to tell you that, but for Andrew Tate to, you know, create this straw man of someone that's just like did stubbornly weak or something. And then he says, well, surely wouldn't you want my perspective? Cause my way is better. Just don't be depressed. <laughs> yeah to me tell you it's not real right. but instead they're defending it and sticking up for it which i find very interesting so that's the first thing in regards to whether i have had any of my convictions challenged it's kind of amazing maybe it's just a semantics trick and maybe it's that simple maybe it's as simple as saying i feel a little bit depressed today but i am not a depressed person right. and i cannot become depressive i'm not good so actually what he's talking about is a well-known and established technique in treating people with various different issues, including depression. You can call it cognitive therapy, you can call it narrative therapy. That exact phrase will be used in therapy. I've used it sometimes or proposed it. You know, they will say, I experience depression, but I am not a depressed person. And what they mean by that is, I'm not going to let this become my identity because if I let it become my identity, then I've truly given up or I'm truly lost or mm -hmm. everything will be filtered through that identity. Mm -hmm. I'm experiencing depression every day for the past three months, but I refuse to believe that I am a depressed person. Or uh, it can be medical too. Someone can say, I, have, I experience chronic pain, but I refuse to be a chronic pain person. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm not going to be labeled as that. I'm not going to think of myself as that. I experience. I actually on purpose only mention the fibromyalgia so often in posts because I don't want to be the borderline girl. I don't want to be the fibromyalgia girl. I don't want to like have, I don't, I don't want to stick myself in a niche because I don't identify very heavily with those things. Um, you know what I mean? Like I use them quickly when we're talking like, I say like, oh, borderline reacts. Like this is just saying, it's just, again, it's for the views. I think people have to remember, like 
online, this is content. This is content. So when I make a video and I'm like, oh, borderline reacts, it's just because it's content, guys. But like in my actual consciousness, I don't think of like, it's just for branding. It, is, it, is, it has nothing to do with how I see myself. But for some people, it is how they see themselves, right? And so you really got to work on that because if your identity becomes the thing that's like impacting you negatively, it's like, bro, you know, you're our fibromyalgia girl. Thank you. I worked out yesterday. I feel pretty good. And I won't lie. I feel a lot better today because I did work out. I've been getting better sleep the last two nights, which has been great. But um, working out really helps. Wow. Like I fool girls. These 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 thighs going to be thick soon, girls. I'm, I'm trying chronic pain and it's awful. Another tangent to this is to externalize. Various different therapies use this technique of saying, I am me and the depression is over here. It's happening at me. And I might even give it a name like Mr. Poopy Pants or, <laughs> or the demon. You know, I'm just thinking of names that clients have used or the dark sphere or something. <laughs> and it helps to say that because for some people, when they're depressed, they start to think of... Gee, I think you're misunderstanding the um, context of cope. You said if you only get your happiness from your consciousness or existence, then you don't need to cope. Um, uh, that's not the only way to use the word cope. Like, I use it in many other ways. I don't know if you guys do, but, like, if I haven't got enough sleep that night because I'm having PTSD nightmares, I still will power my way and cope with the fact that I haven't slept and tell myself, like, I'm not even tired. I'm not even tired. It's a cope. Of course, I'm fucking tired. But like, I just tell myself, like, I'm not even tired. It's like reverse psychology. But I have to like, you know, fake it till you make it feels like a cope to me. Are you using words differently? Because I feel like that's what I would refer to as a cope. Do you guys use the words differently? Let me know because I definitely, that's what I say. I'm like, oh, I'm coping hard today. I just tell myself I'm fine. Like when my partner's like, how do you feel? I was like, I feel great. I'm, I'm powerful. He's like, you're literally internally crying. And I was like, I'm coping. Let me cope because like I have to get through my day, right? So I don't know. Give it as being a part of who they are. It, be, it becomes infused in their personality. And when, for some, not everyone, but when they do that, then it can be very hard to dislodge it. Even when, you know, for some people, when they actually start to recover from depression, you know, say that they've been depressed for five years, 15 years, and they actually go to therapy, they go on medication, they start to emerge. They might, for example, they get invited to something, and as soon as they get the invitation, they're like, I don't go to that, because they still identify as a depressed person, even though if they thought about it, they actually want to go to the thing they're being invited to, but they're operating from the identity mm of a depressed person. Mm -hmm. I suspect for Andrew Tate, if he truly has never been depressed, that there have been times when he has felt demoralized and pessimistic and worried about the future or maybe even wanting to give up, wanting to just, oh, I just can't, I just, I just can't do any, I can't try anymore. I don't want to <laughs> fight anymore. I just have to, I just want to sit here. And then he finds that if he you know says no i'm not going to give up i'm going to i'm going to continue to fight for him he's saying that's depression that's not pro you know, i don't know but if that is the case that's not depression that's just demoralization that's lack of well burnout that kind of thing and and you know i i, I think that that would be fine if that's mm. what, now <laughs> you know the asterisk to all this is that if the allegations are even somewhat on the mark, then it, it sounds funny to say that it's okay. I'll just say it's okay for an individual, independent of the situation that they're in, to engage in that way of thinking if they're trying to get out of demoralization. To have depression. Maybe it's just a semantics trip. And by saying that alone, I understand that it's a temporary state of mind, which I can alter and I can affect. And I've never struggled with long-term depression or long-term negative thoughts because I don't believe in that mental model. So I've never struggled from long-term depression. I've never suffered from short-term depression because I was raised very well. <laughs> and biologically, I'm not uh, prone to that. People in my family aren't prone to that. We're prone to anxiety. I mm -hmm. I've never had to clinic, I've never even been close to being clinically depressed, but it's not because I have this magical willpower of some sort. It's genetics, it's upbringing, it's attachment. So it, he's attributing it to his 
willpower or strength or something. And I, I, I think he's one, at the very least, trying to sell his product. Because if he says this, then he can get people to pay for things and he can make more money. But I also wonder if he needs to believe this because he needs to feel like he is superior and special. Believe in that, I don't think it's possible, so it just doesn't happen. You said you experienced depression, some form of depression or depression, depressive feelings and sadness in prison. What, what were the thoughts that were coming up? What? So <laughs> this is a, a question that I might ask too in this situation. Everything depends on what Andrew Tate, if he were to talk with me or someone like him, what they wanted from me. Mm -hmm. You know, you might wonder, well, why would someone like Andrew Tate even come to therapy? Well, I'll tell you from memory and also just from research that people who present like Andrew Tate, they're, they might come across like they have everything figured out and they might consciously believe that they have everything figured out, but the underlying traumas and their defenses and the way they treat other people result often in them having a very hard time getting their needs met, S specifically their needs met regarding dependency, interdependency, mutual dependency and love and attachment and neediness. They deny their neediness very firmly and are very upset if you even imply that they have needs around this, that they, that they have normal human emotions and attachment needs. And so they will go their whole life without getting those needs met and they will become um, symptomatic in some way. Uh, they might become depressed, they might use a lot of substances, they might feel empty on the inside, they might feel like their life is meaningless, they might notice that they're getting into a lot of fights with their mm. spouse or that they find they, they are quick to rage in ways that they can't control and so they might get fired from a job, they might go through a divorce, and suddenly, even though they know they have everything figured out, they also suspect that something's going on, so they end up in therapy. Another presentation is that they, they kind of know that something's going on with them, but they don't really know what it is, and they can't really admit that there's anything wrong with them, but they do want to explore things. They, You know, I just had a thought about the a stereotype of the masculine man that suffers in silence and how that's such a fucking cope. There is like this certain category, the specific category of coping in like suffering in silence um, man, you know, this like sort of faux stoic or man who like, I'm, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. I have to relate it to this bubble as well. Men who are like, nobody cares about men's feelings and men have to suffer in silence. Um, I'm not going to read your fucking mind. Okay? I'm not going to read your mind. I'm not going to hold your hand. I'm not going to pull you out of your fucking language barriers. I'm not going to do the fucking work. Okay? I'm going to meet you halfway. And if you can meet me, great. And if you can't, that's on you, my home skillet. Okay? But so many men are like, nobody cares about men's feelings. Are you telling people? Are you going to a proper therapist? Because... Dr. Kirkonda would be happy to listen to your feelings. People would be happy to listen to your feelings if you even knew how to express them without making it our problems, right? And so I think that's kind of the issue is like this man who suffers in silence, but then also goes, no one cares about my feelings. It's like, okay, sir, get the folk over it, you know, but also, you know, you know what I mean? It's just like people just self-sabotage in a way that I think is just too poetic not to also roll my eyes at. It's like, I, I can't believe you live in a world, I love these bubbles, where men are, you know, logical and they're the most like based, but also no one cares about men's feelings. But also you never tell anyone you have any feelings. So everyone thinks you don't have any problems. And then you're like, I can't believe the world doesn't care about my problems. Well, they don't know you have them because you won't even talk about them in the first place. You have enough flexibility within their personality to say, I would like to explore my childhood or the way that I think or philosophies that I should be adhering to. And they might even... I'm sorry, Dooms. Thank you for derailing this conversation. Brittany, where do I meet self-aware girls that are my age? 19. Um, That's a great question. I would meet them in like philosophy discords or philosophy channels or mental health channels or mental health groups. I would meet them in a place where research is done. But honestly, if I'm going to be real with you, like where do you hang out? Where do you go? 
Because the truth is like, look at your life and actually think about what you're doing. Like for me, I wasn't going to meet my husband in a physical location because I don't leave my house. So I met him on a Discord, my Discord, right? So like, think about that, right? Where, where do I hang out? I hang out on the internet. And I was like sending this little signal to like, where do, where do you hang out? Because where would she be? If, you know what I mean? She'd be where like you might be. But where would she be is the question. She'd probably be in a place where they talk about ideas, right? Or there's a meditation group or there's a, a reading group. Like you, if you're self-aware, be self-aware enough to know where you hang out and then figure out where she might be. But the truth is, is like, it might not be your time to meet her either. But yeah, I would go, I would go where I am. And if I don't leave the house, I'd go to my online communities, you know? seek out a therapist that they perceive as having a lot of intelligence. For a lot of people like this, it's it's incredibly important that they find someone that they believe to be at their- A man must suffer in silence to be respected in today's society, dark truth. Oh my God, literally go watch a sunset, okay? It is such a self-sabotage idea that you think that is true. Like, it's so silly, I don't care about your feelings. You know why I can't care about your feelings? Because you don't even care about your feelings. You do not care enough about yourself for me to care about you. I can't care about people who do not care about themselves. I just can't. What a waste of time. You're saying, as an evolved animal over time, you're just not the bell curve of people that are useless. You're just useless. Like, that's what you are. You know, not to quote Asmongold, but literally... Some people have got to be the failures of society and those are going to be the failures. Like in some capacity, you're going to fail on some front. If you can't acknowledge your own feelings and let the world suffer, like let the world, you know, be there for you through your suffering and recognize like it's not the world that's there for you, by the way. It's you who's there for yourself and then people around you. Or you can pay a therapist like the rest of us do. You know what I'm saying? But like if you're a man who thinks I have to suffer in silence because that's what the world needs of me, like go ahead and be that statistical failure part of society have fun bitch i just moved to phoenix and it's bot city Brittany, girl phoenix is difficult to socialize in i feel you you know what i mean yes go to the library ingrid's right go to the library i love a library you know what i mean but i don't understand this like this part of the world has got it like in just a bell curve kind of way there's just going to be a part of society right that isn't that isn't going to be self-aware enough to actually like be useful to themselves and that's just what it's going to be it's just what it's going to be. Okay. Cam Kim says, my dad suffered in silence for a long time until he got in his 50s. He cried a lot. My mom and I are just like, what the fuck? Or like, basically, I'm assuming you mean like, what the fuck? Yeah. Face yourself. But understand that you created this for yourself. You made it so you didn't want to invest in yourself enough. Like you'll invest in your business. You'll invest in your muscles, but you won't invest in your feelings. If you looked at somebody who didn't invest in their muscles or in their business and said, you're useless, you're a failure to yourself, I look at you and think you didn't invest in your feelings. Useless. Literally. Like, okay, it's the same thing. You want to be a whole rounded human being? You got to invest in your feelings, my bros. If you do not want to be well-rounded, then cool. Pursue things that don't require you to really face yourself fully. You can do it. You can cope your whole life and be successful. You really can. You can figure out a way to do it, you know? Their level intellectually wise. And so they might seek out a therapist and, and you know, when they come to my office, the beginning of therapy can feel very uh, without foundation because I, I don't know, I keep asking them like what they want and they keep saying exploration and I'm like, okay, what do you want to explore? And then they might explore certain things, but at the end of every session, it feels like I don't, it's not, because there are people that want to explore things, but the, the real issue is with these folks is they're not actually wanting to explore things. Mm. They keep running into a barrier. Mm -hmm. they, they have some part of their motivation and their personality that's saying, I need help, but another part of them is saying, no, no, no. So they do this limbo zone in therapy where they're kind of exploring, but not really. And so once I detect mm -hmm. that, then I do a lot of various things based on what's being presented and I'll test the waters. I'm trying to um, connect with this part of them and I'm trying to soothe this part of them. I'm like, hey, it's, you know, you don't need that. It's okay. The barrier's fine, you know, and, but you know, this part is, is a good part. Let's, you know, let's, let's let it over the barrier sometimes. That's the visual I guess I have in my mind right now, but and there's other presentations too, but at, at any rate, he is now asking, David's now asking, so you identify in prison that you were sad, depressed, something was happening. What was going on there? 
So this will be very interesting to see how Andrew Tate responds, because if he has it in him, and he also trusts David, and he is willing to share with the entire world on the internet, then he might say something like, well, yeah, it was a pretty dark moment for me. But I, you know, but then, but at the very least, he would admit that he does have human emotion. But there's another possibility that if this, because if I were in David's shoes, I wouldn't ask this question at this point because I would worry that I would step on a landmine. And the risk here is that Andrew Tate could, uh, well, one, just walk out. <laughs> That'll happen sometimes. But the other is that he'll say, well, you know, I said depression, but you know, everything, you know, <laughs> it's astonishing how denial works for people. Well, they want the brownie points for saying I was depressed, but I got over it. But because the people who are depressed and can't quote, quote, get over it, they're like, I'm better than you. I got over it. But then it's like Sneeko on the Dr. K conversation. He was like, I don't have ADHD. I think it's fake. No, no, no. I have ADHD and it's like a superpower. It's like they can't decide, do I want to acknowledge this thing? And then do I want to acknowledge that it's different for everybody? And it's like, no, because they're selling this mythos of a universal truth that they have access to, which they don't. Like they do not have access to universal truth. Like none of us do. None of us have access to objective, objective, objective truth, right? We only have access to little slivers of information that might eventually become a puzzle piece and the very wide understanding of objective truth. But because people like Tate and Sneeko and Ego and everybody, actually, most people, I think, do rely heavily on thinking they know the objective truth. And I think that's really, really important to pay attention to is like what is... And what is like what is proper? What is the expectation of what we should sort of encourage in others? And it's again, it's a very confusing because you don't actually know what you're aiming for. If you're aiming for radical acceptance and love, you have to turn the other cheek to your to your enemy. If you're looking for um, ostracization and intolerance and only a bubble you face feel safe in, then cool. There's like a way to do that. If you're looking for, you know, isolation, there's a way to do that. If you're looking for community, there's a way to do that. If you're looking for just like, what are you looking for? If you're looking for a capital T objective truth, well, you're going to die before you figure that out. But I can't, you know, what a great adventure, right? What a great adventure. But, you know, again, I pay attention, pay attention to how they, they want the credit for overcoming something, but also can't acknowledge it really exists because then it's actually something people suffer from. And then they have to argue that all suffering is equal. So their suffering doesn't even matter. Like if they don't think it matters that you're suffering then their suffering also doesn't matter. Andrew Tate is trying to make a claim that he suffered and overcame. Sneeko's trying to make a claim that life is suffering and hard and they overcame. But then that means like everyone's suffering is different and everyone's on a journey of suffering. And if we're going to validate your suffering, then you have to validate other people's suffering. And they can't do that because if they do that, then they lose the footing of sort of that suffering is the same. Because if they're saying they suffer differently, and I suffer differently, then how can they make a prescription that's objective for all suffering? People, and when you're really concentrating on a client and you see them within the same sentence or paragraph completely contradict themselves, you see that transition from, you know, saying something to denying it. And, and I, you know, I don't judge it. I do it too. We all do it. There's a reason for that. G says there's no answer in the external. It's all within. Well, I think that's sort of, false right because like again you you accumulate information with the external at hand to know the within so you don't really literally mean that right it doesn't mean anything what you're saying like oh the answer only comes from me okay technically the answer comes within because you have the reference of the outside so you ask yourself the question you're pondering you go to the world to get their tools you come back and ponder it within so the answer is within but to clarify, the answer is not without the external. You have to extrospect as much as you introspect. They have to be in cohesion together. But there's a possibility that he'll just go into complete denial. Although he's already led the way. So I, let's, see, let's see what Andrew Tate does here. Today's video is sponsored by Ada. So I got COVID recently 
It was probably the sickest I've ever been in my entire life. It was the worst. Well, did you know there are treatments you can take for COVID-19? And that means that there's something you can do if you get COVID, things you can do to avoid getting really sick. And that's where data comes in. You take their free questionnaire online, I've taken it, it's confidential, and you find out if you or a loved one may be eligible for treatment. If eligible, you can talk to a clinician via telehealth within two hours, and if prescribed, you can pick up your treatment from a local pharmacy. So Yay. click the link below to find out if you are eligible and learn more about treatment options. What was happening? Well, there's a lot of uncertainty, which is the first thing which that I- That has to be scary. It is scary. And then David very adeptly identifies with the emotion for therapists and really for parents, for teachers, just friends. This is a very good thing to keep in mind that when people first present, you know, I'll be talking to other therapists who obviously have a lot of emotional intelligence. And even those folks will frame things intellectually. They will intellectualize as a defense. So what happened was fear, was the terrifying feeling that Andrew Tate was going through because of the uncertainty. The uncertainty was happening of, will I be in prison forever? Will everything fall apart for me? Will I have no more fans? You know, you know, it's terrifying. You could say it's justified that he has that terror, but whatever. He has that terrifying feeling, but he intellectualizes that as he recalls it and says, there was a lot of uncertainty. The therapist, again, friend, listener, parent, teacher, it can help if you think that it's safe enough to do this, to say, wow, that must have been terrifying. And the fact that Andrew Tate responded, well, one, the fact that Andrew Tate even presented something that David could respond means that Andrew Tate is flexible enough, healthy enough, if you, if you will, uh, and trusts David enough to say such a thing. And maybe he learned something in prison that... It's funny to me that he'll engage with the therapist is more like himself and validate the therapy because it looks for good for the brand. And that's, again, the irony. Like, everyone believes in a form of therapy that makes sense within their bubble. Everyone believes in a sense of counseling that works within their bubble. Everyone believes in medicine as long as it works within their bubble. Everyone believes in everything as long as it works within their bubble. Everyone even believes with about... Everyone believes lying is good depending on how it works within their bubble. In my bubble, it's about survival lying. I believe in survival lying. So even I, a person who always talks about how much she hates lying, I think survival lying is very, very valid, right? Like you're in a survival situation, it's life or death. You better lie your ass off, girl. But again, you know, everyone can justify everything within the nuance of their bubble or within the nuance of existing in existence. And I think that's fair. I think it's probably good that Andrew Tate is at least promoting an idea of therapy to his audience. Even Sneeko said like some vet veterinarians have real PTSD and they could benefit from therapy. It's like because if they say mental health isn't real, then they're discounting all the men in the military that suffer. They're discounting all the masculine men that are willing to admit they're suffering from PTSD. And so they have to appeal to their audiences in a way that – doesn't also contradict too much their initial ideas around mental health and how it's quote unquote fake and how you should turn to God. He needed to talk about this more. So I don't know. Who knows? But he says uncertainty. David says that must have been terrifying. And he's Seven says how often are Americans really in survival though? I mean, all the time. You don't have to have a gun to your head to be in survival mode. Like being having a like being in survival mode is like your job will fire you if they find out you're gay, which is a very real thing that happens in the United States. So being in survival mode is like, oh, my my company's not going to give me a recommendation if they find out I smoke weed. That's survival mode, girl. Lie your ass off. You're sober. Says it in an empathetic way. And then Andrew Tate says, yes, it was terrifying. That's when you know therapy is working or a conversation is working. When as David intuits very quickly and might have even been kind of setting it up or trying to get to this place. I wouldn't be surprised if David didn't have a plan but was mm. acting intuitively but had kind of a general direction that he wanted to go. That's typical because it's uh, the thing that happens with therapy. Novice therapists, they tend to make a lot of plans because they're really nervous about providing therapy. And so uh, you know, the night before they'll be like taking, okay, I want to do this. I want to get here. I want to get 99.99% of the time, those plans are completely thrown out the window because you cannot predict what will happen in a session, even with clients that are fairly predictable. Anyway, so David, uh, uh, you know, ask that question. And then Andrew's like the, the quickness, right? You're past someone's defenses. And the fact that Andrew Tate, you know, eye contact, that's another kind of thing to watch is that when mm. when does Andrew Tate look at his eyes as opposed to not? 
for people who present like this, and I don't know Andrew Tate's personality, but people who present like this typically have a, a background, an upbringing in which they were harmed and or neglected fairly significantly. And early in life, at the age of 12 months old, they learned it was better not to have eye contact because to have eye contact meant that you were gonna get hurt or rejected. And so it's just better to turn away and to not be noticed or to just focus on something else. And so when they're exploring and having a conversation, they will tend to do this. If you ever notice, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's not something that's always, the, you know, eye contact is kind of complicated. Some people just need to think and so they will not look at your face because it's easier for them to concentrate if they're sort of just looking into the void. But, uh, and there's a lot of pseudoscience around eye movements. It's all nonsense. Science yeah. has debunked it a thousand times over. Mm. But, uh, but eye contact. I realized this with um, why that's so important too, because I, my eye contact is very specific. I tend to have to look away from everything so I don't lose my train of thought. So it looks like everyone's like, oh, she looked to the left. She looked to the right. Oh, it's lying. It's not lying. But for me, I'm like imagining what I'm saying. So that happened to me on stream once where I looked away to put my thoughts together and I was muted. And so I wasn't looking at chat. So I was talking forever, but I wasn't looking at chat. So because it would have distracted me and I would have lost my thought. But then I was muted and you guys were trying to tell me, Brittany, you're muted. So even for me, I try to pay attention to the fact that I have a tendency to look away because I'm trying to imagine my thoughts. And I, I rely heavily on not losing my train of thought by imagining. And so that's something that I pay attention to like I'm pretty sure in general it's why I also wave my arms and I use my hands as I'm like using visual visual things to like stimulate a thought but uh yeah all that stuff about body language and stuff it only means so much for so many people you have to for me when I'm trying to pay attention to people's body language I'm trying to think oh dude does this mean something different to them like oh when they do this does it is it does it mean this or does it mean this it's not that they're doing it that it means something it's that why are they doing it and what does it mean? Tact is something that will show patterns and does have indications of something potentially. Anyway, but he locks in on David. <laughs> like, let's rewatch that. Depressive feelings and sadness in prison. What, what were the thoughts that were coming up? Mm -hmm. what, what was happening? Well, there's a lot of uncertainty, which is the first thing which that I- That has to be scary. It is scary. It's scary. And also- So if I had a supervisee, a trainee in my university or someone I was supervising who showed me a clip like this, I would really highlight how well they nailed that. They set up the question, not manipulatively, but they intuited to ask, you know, like, what was it like there? And also the delivery that David has. He is natural. He's, he doesn't come across like he's trying to get him, right? He it comes across like he's a human being, like he's asking from his own heart, not from his head. So he's asking that question. Andrew Tate responds. And then immediately David says, it must have been in the, the natural way that he responds. Oh, that must have been terrifying it, you know i could role play a robotic version of that like that must have been terrifying i don't know <laughs> it, so with my trainees and myself when i was first becoming a therapist you're often terrified of what it is to be a therapist and so you just want a prescription it's like tell me what to do and you end up absor you know, absorbing these listening techniques and then you try to follow those rules but when you're thinking about them too much, they don't come from your soul, from your heart, from your humanness, and mm. other people will be put off by that, obviously. So you have to get so used to those techniques such that they just naturally fly out of you, emerging from your humanness, which it did seemingly for David, and I think Andrew Tate responded to that in that mm. way. He was totally in control of your world, of your life. And right. that's almost like an imperative for you. Right. And that gives you power. And all of a sudden you're thrust into a situation where you're essentially helpless. Well, you just nailed it. You, you completely nailed it because I was exactly about to say, it's the uncertainty that I struggle with the most because in my life, I'm in charge of everything. I know exactly how everything works and I'm the boss and I get to control absolutely everything. And this is the first time in a long time I'm in a scenario where I have no power whatsoever, yeah. no influence, basically. Uh -huh. I don't know what's gonna happen. Nobody else knows what's gonna happen. Mm. So that's interesting. And I'm guessing that David is picking up on this, that Andrew Tate is, I don't know if he knows he's revealing this, but he's essentially revealing that he has a complex or a- Well, the dilemma, it's, yeah, it's the dilemma is like, 
because Sneeko and him are so performative and they know they're being performative, but they also have to reveal enough of like a human part of them to be relatable. So it's really difficult to know like how much they're revealing. G says, is a life is temporary a toxic cope? It can be. So if you say life is temporary and you're coping, then it's toxic. If you're like, life is temporary, so I'm going to be more grateful and hold humility and be just like grateful for every day, then it's not a cope. It's a self-awareness. So if you say like life is temporary and it's sort of a negative, evokes a negative feeling in you versus a grateful feeling like, oh my God, I'm so grateful for my loved ones. I'm so grateful I have technology. I'm so grateful. Then it's not a cope. And that's the thing is like, I am so aware that life is temporary. So I am so grateful for every opportunity I have with people. And I'm grateful for the time I have for myself. And I'm so, it's about gratitude versus like cynicism and edge lord and nihilism of the two bubble, which is like life is temporary. We're all going to die. It's like, yeah, if you have like a negative connotation, like a negative relationship with it, like a selfless, like a, like a self-loathing or like a crushing feeling, then that's not a healthy relationship with it, right? Life is temporary is a fact. It's a scientific fact as far as we know in relation to our lived consciousness, having awareness. Maybe there's life after death, but what we call life, the way we understand it is going, well, maybe then it's not objective, but it's like a subjective understanding of what, as close as we get to sort of an objective, which is like when your grandma dies and you bury her, you don't get to have another relationship with her as far as you know. So like just accepting reality is beautiful, but gratitude is kind of the key of that, I think, in my mind, you know? Need for the defense mm. that involves him constantly being in control and or believing that he's in control. None of us are in control of wide swaths of our lives. For people that go through sudden medical changes will attest to that. You know, we tend to walk around thinking, well, as long as I eat right and exercise right and take care of my body, everything will be fine. And then all of a sudden, boom, something yeah. happens, regardless of you taking care of yourself. And mm -hmm. then you realize, oh, I guess I don't have full control over my life. And so that notion that he believes that he's in constant control of everything is absurd. And we all benefit from recognizing that we don't have full control over things. And existentially, we really have to accept it. We have so this is a very important conversation to be having. And of course, you guys know the difference between acknowledging like what you're in control of internally and externally. So obviously, I'm only in control of now, 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 right now, right now, right now, right now, right now, right now, like every millisecond that I am in, like I'm in control right now. But, you know, depending on, you know, if my husband came screaming in the room and like poured a glass of water on me, like. I might freeze and in that moment I, my body is more in control than my consciousness because my consciousness might, might need like a rebooting moment where I'm like, what the fuck just happened? It was like so shocking that I don't even know what's going on. And until I react, is my biology, like is my instinct reacting faster than my consciousness is? Is my consciousness reacting like in the moment? It's like, oh my gosh, but then I'm accountable because my body did the reaction. But when people say, um, like, I'm not in control, they can use it as a, an excuse to do bad. Well, I'm not in control or an excuse to hold or a reason to hold power. So Andrew Tate is obviously using it as a cope to hold power. I'm in control. I control everything that I do. But what if it comes out that they have objective evidence that he sex trafficked women? Then would Andrew Tate say I had complete control over my actions or would he say like, oh, I was traumatized as a kid and my dad left and my mom had to raise us and I was poor and I had to do MMA fighting or kickboxing to get any kind of, you know, money in the world. And oh, I struggled and my brother and I were just like poor boys. The way we play mind games with ourselves versus like what is just probably also true, like without a doubt, his dad leaving contributed to how Andrew Tate treats women. No doubt the fact that him and his brother struggled in sort of a poverty-stricken neighborhood contributed to how Andrew Tate thinks about the world. Like, no doubt all of these things contribute. And in some instances, he's not going to have the most control over those things. And in some instances, he will. But he didn't have control over his dad leaving. His dad left because he's a piece of shit, right? Like, when people don't stay in your life and aren't consistently there, like, they're making that decision. But you didn't control that as a kid. It's not the kid's fault, right? that the world, like it happened that way. The kid just has to grow up learning that you are only in control of what you do 
in the moment that you actually have that type of control. Like if you go through a huge adrenaline spike because you got in a car accident and your body starts to shake, you have no control over that because the adrenaline is so intense, your body is going to shake. If you get MS, you're not in control of your body. Your body is sort of like dictated by the MS, the relationship it's having with the MS. So again, like you have to have a relationship, right, with what are you actually in control of and what is your body more technically in control of in the moment from something as simple as like, I don't know, like I said, like a relationship you're having with something like MS, you know what I mean? So again, the conversation is really difficult because like, what are we exactly talking about? You know what I mean? have to fully embrace the reality that we don't have control over some very fundamental things like life itself. We all die. We don't have control over that. We don't have control over time and aging and the economy right. and, and uh, our spouses, let That's alone right. our own behavior and psychology. Mm. So the notion that he's in constant control of everything in his life mm -hmm. all the time, you know, it just illuminates some need. I, I'm contrasting that with, you know. That's why it feels like a cope because he can't, he doesn't, we don't have, I don't have control over you. I don't have control over anything. I only have control over what I have control over, which is only so much of myself, right? I don't have control over when my fibro impacts me, but I can kind of mitigate the pain by working out. You know what I mean? The fact that he says he's in constant control is in such contrast with reality. It points to that he needs to believe and will do a lot of things. And his viewers need to believe it. His viewers need to believe he's in control all the time. But again, this is a very nuanced perspective to say we're not in control all the time while still saying we're in control of our actions or at least responsible for how we have a relationship with those actions, which is why a, a real apology goes a long way which is why saying sorry in a way that you mean it and you transform through that apology means something because it's an awareness that you didn't have control, but you're aware that it was still bad. You're aware that you did have control and you hurt someone and it was bad. You're aware that you did a bad thing, but it doesn't make you a bad person. You're aware that forgiveness is possible, but not something you beg for. Like being heartfelt, really having a connection, having a real conversation, there's something to that that's so specific, you know? things to give him evidence that he's in control. And of course, that points potentially to trauma that he was traumatized. You know, when people go through trauma early or really throughout one's life, but particularly when it's chronic over time as a child, whether you consciously identify with this or not, you will feel very much like you have no control over things, um, particularly if the chaos and the abuse and the mistreatment had to do with things like your parents moving from town to town or your parents with substance abuse can also cause children, even though the ch child isn't being abused directly, they feel very much out of control, like they wish they had control. And then once they get older and they have more power over their lives, one road of defensive structure is to be obsessive about control such that you will uh, not have to risk going back to the way things were when you were young. The irony is that when individuals do this, they tend to, in a way, recreate what happened when they were young inadvertently. Because when you're a two-year-old child, five-year-old child, what you're wanting is security and love and attunement and safety and, and certainty, or at least a lack of, uh, of undue uncertainty. And so when you are denied that and there's chaos and abuse and mistreatment, and you're like, okay, if I only had control, then I would be able to get that attunement and love and safety. And then uh, they just focus on the control. Then they grow up and they say, okay, I'm, I'm doing the control thing. And they will push out all relationships and any flexibility. Exactly. Because in order exactly. To ooh, 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 ooh. exactly. Okay. So you have a person who's like, um, I'm changing. Look how I changed. Look how I got rid of all these people in my life, but you're not actually getting rid of the issue that brought those people into your life in the first place, which is you. So you'll have a person who has a cope of, look how I destroyed everything around me that I knew was bad, but you forgot to destroy yourself. You forgot to destroy the part of you that made that environment for you, you yourself in the first place, which is why when you watch Boogie and you know he's not going to transform, it's because he's not getting rid of himself. The version of his consciousness that repeats those patterns. That's why it always has to do with you. It has to do with the relationship you're having with yourself. You can destroy the world. 
you can destroy everyone in it, but until you destroy yourself, it's just going to be the same over and over again. It's why we repeat cycles. It's why breaking generational curses is so incredibly difficult because you have to destroy the thing that keeps it going, which is yourself. You have to mourn yourself and transform yourself and change it so it doesn't continue into this next cycle, right? But people destroy all the things around them. They quit their jobs. They get a new car. They move states and they go, look, I changed. You didn't change, bro. You put a new fresh paint on it. It's still trash, you know? Be in a relationship. You have to accept that you don't have control over much, <laughs> you know, but with my wife. I have zero control over her and her personality. Uh, I don't even have control over myself for crying out loud. How could I possibly have control over? See, but when Dr. Kirkonda says that, he confuses a bunch of people who do meditation practices, who work on facing their consciousness. Now, I don't think Dr. Kirk has done. I don't know how much of that he's done, to be fair. Um, I love Dr. Kirkonda. I obviously, know, like I know, I think I know which bubble he lives in. I think I know what his prescriptions are by the way he talks. And I love, like, this is no shade because I like him so much. But obviously, like when you're in a meditative bubble and you're hearing like, you don't have control over yourself. Well, that's not a lived experience that I'm experiencing when I'm practicing heavy meditation and I'm actually... <clears throat> I'm actually trying to face myself and I feel like I do have, in, I have more control than I've ever had in my whole life of myself because I'm trying to take tools from people that have, have exhibited um, or have, have been giving and sharing these tools for thousands of thousands of years, right? So um, I, I think it's confusing language, but I think what he means to say is you only have so much control and you have to acknowledge when you don't, but I do think you can practice a lot of meditation techniques to seek enlightenment or whatever that means to you, an understanding with yourself existing in existence. I do think you can practice self-control. I do think you can have more control than less control. And I do think you can always have more control than less. So I don't think there's a limit to how much you can control. There's only a matter of how much you learn to control throughout your journey, which for some people takes a lot longer or isn't as much or isn't what you think it's going to look like. Again, it's not about saying, oh, I'm never going to have intrusive thoughts again, or I'm never going to be this again, or I'm never going to be angry again. It's not none of that. It's just saying I'm going to each time I come across a problem, make it less of a problem next time, even if it's just like 0.5 of a percent. You know, it's not about eradicating it 100 percent, you know. Ayan says, the comments about mourning the self and dying in order to change, is that language intentionally similar to biblical language and teachings? I don't know. To be honest with you, like, I consume bubbles all day. I just consume everyone's language all day. I'm just using words that m are most meaningful when I say them to myself. So I use the words that make my brain see their significance. The reason I point out the word bubble is because everyone uses it, but no one really thinks of how powerful that concept is. Everyone uses the word bubble and does they don't even know what it means. Like they don't even really recognize, like I'll hear Asmin use it or Abba used it the other day in a video. He'd be like, oh, this is such an interesting bubble, but they don't recognize like everyone's in a bubble. So well, I use it so much and it gets people mad, but I want to use it in a way that makes you think, why is she using it so much? It's because it's so significant. Like it's such a significant word. If you really think about the power of that language, like, oh my gosh, we all live in a bubble. Like, so is that bad? Is that good? Are we moralizing it? No, I don't think, I think it's neutral, right? So I try to use words that mean the most to my brain, though that does limit my audience to an extent because you guys use words differently than me and then you have to translate it. And then when I read your language, I have to translate it. Um, but when I'm talking about mourning the self and dying, I, I think I am taking strictly from meditation bubbles, probably more spiritual metaphysical bubbles for sure. For her and, and accepting that and working within that reality and having humility around that and uh, giving, allowing other people to run the show when they want to or when they need to is a part of a relationship and that that's how things go. And so when someone dedicates themselves, you know, obsessively to control, you could imagine that they would deny themselves any kind of relationship. So they're actually recreating the past and that they're very alone. All right, well, let's adjourn there. So if you didn't know, we have a membership program on YouTube where people can join the channel. Yes, join by Dr. Kirk's memberships. He's so good. Okay, 
So great video, great insight from Dr. Kirk. Again, I will continue this series as we go along slowly um, because I would like to see his observations of Tate and what we can learn from it. And the cool thing is like Dr. Kirk belongs in more of a progressive bubble. He comes from Seattle. He um, talks in a way that really hits my brain really good. But it's interesting because he doesn't talk a lot about like metaphysics or spiritualism like Dr. Kirk. K does. And that's why I also like Dr. K because he talks more about the metaphysics and the meditation. He talks about the consciousness in a very specific way. I think it's why I enjoy the balance of both of them together. And they're both very thoughtful and they have a lot of tools at their disposal that I would love to learn and get from them. You know what I mean? So great observation. I do think that uh, it's necessary for Tate in so many ways to do what he's doing because he's juggling so many personas and he has a lot of responsibility that he has to pay attention to because of the life he's created for himself. So again, you know, karma is not you do good, you get good. Karma is re your life reflected back to you. It's what you've put into your life. That's your karma. And it's also like sort of what you've been given. And this is your life. Like your life is your karma. And so you have to pay attention to that. So for all of the struggle Andrew Tate might feel all of the burden he might feel, he has to really acknowledge that he's given it to himself by his choices. Again, you can blame the world. You can blame is a very specific word, by the way, guys. Blame is an acknowledgement. Blame is an accusation. So you can blame the world all you want. You can blame modern women and blame the world for the reason men are lonely. Or you can acknowledge it's a it's us. We are the reason we are lonely. You know what I mean? It's so funny that the same group of people that talk about not being victims, they build whole careers off blaming other people for their problems. So the irony is, is the victim mentality is throughout all of bubbles. There is no such thing as a truly independent bubble, except from what I found, in my opinion, in the little bit of life I've lived, which is like sort of the meditation bubble, because it purposely forces you not to blame in order to be self, like self-actualized. But that means you cannot blame other people, which is so much harder. Even Andrew Tate can't do it. Even the red pillars cannot help but blame other people for their problems because the victim mentality is too strong in us because it, 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 it allows us to eradicate all responsibility and accountability for ourselves. It's their fault. They're the reason. They're the... I, I'm not the reason, they're the reason, which is, again, it's really important to have a validating moment in your life to say, oh, my parents did this and that's why I do this. But see how it's my parents do this and that's why I do this. So I need to do something different, not, oh, uh, this, my parents do this. This is why I do this and I'll always end up doing this. No, your parents are their own people and you're your own person. Do your own thing, Right. Do your own thing. In my head, in real life while I'm dead, my belly's being fed and I'm okay. I'm just fine, yet all I do is whine, not to you in my mind, cause I know I don't make sense. I've been nothing but blessed, so why's my life a mess? Please tell me, cause I'm sick of thinking, yeah. Sick of reaching out for the truth and living life as a fool.